Hello, welcome to the Thursday, February 28th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. CoinHive today announced that it will discontinue operations in about a week on March 8th. CoinHive made a name for itself by providing JavaScript code that allowed you to mine Monero in browsers. Now, this of course has been heavily abused and CoinHive has taken a lot of criticism for this. The reason to shut down isn't related to this controversy as much as to the decrease in the profitability of Monero mining and some changes to the Monero algorithm that will hit on March 9th. So instead of adjusting their code for this new algorithm, of course there have been a couple other services that essentially copied the CoinHive concept. We'll see if they will continue to operate and and if the discontinuation of CoinHive will lead to a drop in the proliferation of crypto jacking. And a security company Edgewave has yet another case of fishers using Azure block storage. The reason this is interesting is that URLs for Azure's block storage end in windows.net. So if I visit an HTML page that's stored within Azure, well, uh, I actually get a windows.net domain with a proper HTTPS certificate, which may make users more likely to actually enter their credentials. Of course, this is used for Office 365 phishing, which will take best advantage of this domain. Like I said, I don't think that's the first time I've seen this. Uh, also last week, I think it was, we saw Google Translate being used in similar ways in order to hide the actual phishing page behind what looks like a legitimate Google host name. And well, it should be clear that old vulnerabilities never really go away. The Cisco Talus research team is reporting that they see sort of an uptick against an old Elasticsearch vulnerability, CV 2014-3120. This is the old dynamic scripting vulnerability, has long since been fixed in Elasticsearch. I don't think this type of dynamic scripting is available anymore at all. The vulnerability was very easy to exploit and I believe has never really sort of gone away. Like I've uh, seen quite a bit of attempts sort of to use it. Now, Talos was able to learn a little bit more here about the particular attacker by uh, linking back to some of the attacker's uh, Chinese social media pages. Also, the code dropped on servers does include other exploit code that is going after a number of different vulnerabilities like for example weblogic some spring framework vulnerability and as well as a Drupal vulnerability and talking about Drupal, Drupal of course released a patch for yet another remote code execution vulnerability recently. While this particular flaw was only present in fairly specific configurations, so not the same footprint as some of the earlier flaws, Imperva is reporting that they're already seeing exploits being used against vulnerable systems. So the usual recommendation here, if you haven't patched Drupal yet, uh, well, please go ahead and patch quickly, but be aware that your system may already be compromised if you are running a vulnerable version using the vulnerable configuration. I'm talking about patches. F5 released updates for its big IP product. Now, luckily, no remote code execution vulnerability here, just denial of service vulnerabilities, but certainly something of concern for a device like big IP that's supposed to provide high uptime for web servers that it protects. Well, one of the denial of service vulnerabilities is sort of interesting because it does affect multipath TCP. Multipath TCP is a somewhat new TCP option that allows you to split TCP streams between two different IP addresses. But it's certainly an interesting feature. It's one of those things that is not easy to implement. So no real big surprise that it can lead to denial of service if not implemented correctly. 
Well, that is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.